Nearly 10 million people have downloaded Germany's new coronavirus tracing app in just three days. There's still a ways to go. Scientists say that 60% of the public needs to use the app for it to be effective. And the government says that buy-in is critical. The app can help to warn contacts of infected persons faster than was previously possible. And every hour of early warning of a threat of infection is a gain in fighting this virus. But as governments around the world track the virus, can we be sure they also aren't tracking citizens? Tracing apps. Can we trust them? Are they effective? And this is DW's COVID-19 special. I'm Stephen Beardsley in Berlin. It's good to have you with us. Can a surge of new tracing apps help stop the virus's spread? We'll hear from an expert in just a moment. But first, let's look at some of those apps and how they differ. Here in China, as the coronavirus spread, the government set out to fight it with the help of a smartphone app. Launched in February, the Alipay Health Code app was the first attempt to slow the transmission rate of COVID-19 by tracking infected people digitally using information from their smartphones. The app analyzes personal data to assign a color code that either grants users access to or bars them from buses, trains, and public spaces. South Korea launched its own contact tracing program shortly after China, requiring all international visitors to download a tracing app at the airport. But the country's effort to monitor the virus doesn't rely on this app alone. The South Korean Health Authority also tracks infected people using surveillance cameras and credit card information. Singapore led the way in creating an app that can monitor the spread of the virus without government surveillance. The country's app, Trace Together, uses encrypted and anonymized data to alert those who have come in contact with infected people. Australia has launched its own app based on the Trace Together protocol. In Europe, France, Italy and Germany launched coronavirus tracing apps this month, prioritizing privacy. The Italian and German apps use a decentralized approach. They don't store users' information on a server, but rather on the users' phones. The French Stop COVID app, however, is centralized. It does store data on government-run servers, but says the data is deleted after 14 days. The UK is preparing to launch an app similar to the French model later this month. The European Commission has called for a common tracing technology across the EU, but so far member countries have been going it alone. Let's take a closer look at France now. They released its app at the beginning of this month. And as mentioned in that report, it relies on centralized data storage. And that is giving pause to some potential users. Michel downloaded Stop COVID as soon as it was launched. Users who test positive get a barcode they can enter in the app. Stop COVID then alerts other users who they've been in close contact with. The app is on a voluntary basis and obviously doesn't replace other measures like face masks. But it's one out of several tools that can help protect me and the people I meet. Michelle hasn't tested positive, nor has she received an alert. There are no official figures on how many alerts have been sent out so far. But she still hopes the app will be effective. I know that there have been epidemics in the past, but I never thought I'd live to experience one. It was frightening and very worrying, and it's too early to say if it's over. We need to keep up our guard. But only about 2% of people in France have downloaded the app so far. Many are concerned the government might use Stop Covid to track people. But Michel says that doesn't bother her. We are all using mobile phones and being tracked through relay masts. It's very easy to know where people have been at a certain point in time, also through Facebook and Twitter. Compared to that, Stop Covid is not a threat. Michel hopes more people will use the app and that the Covid-19 epidemic soon becomes a thing of the past. I'm joined now by Ralph Jans. He's the founder of Research to Guidance. That's uh, consulting firm for the digital health industry in Berlin. Uh, Ralph, it's good to have you with us, first of all. Now, the German app came out this week, and it already has 10 million downloads. Does that make it a success? 
No, it's definitely a very good start. Uh, also compared to um, other official tracing apps um, in other, of other countries. So uh, they have performed uh, much worse uh, than uh, here in Germany. So it's a good start, but let's see how that further develops. Uh, we think that maybe um, first movers have now downloaded it, yeah, and now becomes a hard part of the game to convince all the other ones, yeah, the ones uh, who are a bit skeptical, yeah, to also download and install this application. But it's a good start, anyhow. Now, this app works without a centralized um, data registry. Should that reassure users about their data security? Yeah, it's definitely uh, a much secure in terms of privacy uh, approach. Uh, so yes, uh, I mean, the balancing of pri uh, data privacy and being able to fight uh, the pandemic with the help of a tracing app, we think yeah, that the balance is being has been reached and uh, we would recommend downloading the application. Now, as we heard earlier, there are plenty of other national apps, France, Italy, um, Singapore, for example. How effective is it going to be when people are traveling across borders and they have their own country's app, but maybe not in other countries? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's still a problem. And so if you met uh, somebody who is affected in another country and uh, but he's using a different app, then your app wouldn't, uh, wouldn't know about it. Yeah. So... Uh, still, our country apps are still not talking to each other. That might take a while until um, those um, solutions are going to be interoperable. Um, but for now, they can't talk to each other. Are we seeing any efforts to create a unified app, for example, maybe in the EU? Yeah, I mean, there, at the very beginning, yeah, there have been uh, discussions on the European level to uh, come up with one approach yeah, which works uh, uh, in all the countries. Yeah, but then it turned out um, that country interests were so different so that each of the countries, uh, they decided to go first their own way. Maybe uh, when uh, there will be a second wave or the pandemic takes um, longer, yeah, then they will meet again and then find ways there yeah, to to merge and to let those applications talk to each other, but not for now. Now, we've been talking about tracing apps this whole time, but there are other digital tools that can be used in this pandemic. Uh, what can you give us an example of? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, there are plenty, and the tracing phase is just a very, very tiny uh, phase yeah, within the overall spectrum of what is uh, what is available out there. So, I mean, there are hundreds of solutions out there which help to educate the users um, about their risk of getting effective or of being affected. There are lots of triage solutions out there which help patients or users here yeah, to find the next testing stations um, and, and also uh, uh, make appointments yeah, with doctors here yeah, to do the test. Then we have the tracking and tracing uh, phase yeah, of this whole pandemic management and then we come to current time management and during current time management there are also lots of tools which have been made available during the pandemic in a very very quick quick way which allows the patients yeah, to manage their basically their their health status with uh, while being uh, quarantined either self-imposed or enforced so there are lots of solutions already out there today all right, Ralph Jans of Research to Guidance, a digital health consulting firm. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's time now to answer your questions about COVID-19. Over to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Does high altitude affect the transmission of COVID-19? Interestingly, yes, um, it seems to. When, when I went looking for information on this, I found a recent study comparing infection rates in low-lying parts of, of China and Bolivia um, to mountainous areas. And it showed that the higher you go, the fewer cases of COVID-19 you find. Um, now, a lot of that's probably down to environmental factors, of course, like, like 
higher UV radiation at altitude and more drastic temperature swings and, and drier air, which could all play a role in hindering um, virus replication. But the researchers also postulated that, that a physiological factor could be playing a role. Um, people who live in low oxygen environments at high altitudes have way fewer ACE2 receptors in their heart and lung cells. It's, it's an adjustment the body makes to, to thin air. And since those are the receptors the virus uses to invade your body, um, having a lot less of them in those organs might protect you. Can you give us a status update on possible vaccines for COVID-19? The WHO is, is keeping a running count of the steadily mounting number of vaccine candidates in the pipeline. There are, are over 140 of them out there now. Of, of those, most are still in what's called the, the preclinical stage, so in, in cell culture or in animal testing. But, but 13 have moved on to clinical evaluation, which means they're being checked for, for safety and efficacy in humans. Um, only one has reached phase three, which is the last stage of the process before approval. Um, by the way, the speed at which this is going is really pretty jaw-dropping. Um, for, for a vaccine candidate, reaching phase three after less than six months is unheard of. The virus reportedly killed the president of Burundi in about four days. Is that common? Burundi is one of the few countries worldwide to, to not impose any restrictions during the pandemic. And that was largely due to its president, uh, Pierre Nkurunziza. Uh, he died in early June from, from what the country's government said was a heart attack after suddenly growing ill. But, but it still hasn't been confirmed that he had COVID-19. Um, if the disease was in some way directly responsible for his death, then the very short time it took to kill him would indeed be anomalous. Um, the most recent study I found puts the average period between the first symptoms and the death of someone who succumbs to the disease at between 17 and 18 days. But, but because blood clots are, of course, one symptom of COVID-19, I guess that could, could theoretically cause a, a sudden crisis, like, like a, a heart attack at, at an earlier stage as well. 